Well, I want you to turn your Bibles. We're going to finish a little bit. Now, we've got more ser- of this series coming up, but Your Next Step is the title of our series through this ministry month. And everything about the progression of our ministry started. Last week, we talked about the conversion of Saul. When Saul was uh, transformed by the power of God that literally changed him. And this morning, we're going to kind of continue that series about that. Your next step. uh, This morning, out of the book of Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 22. Now, they, they told me... This is what we were talking about when we were arranging this service. And we said, Pastor, if you start preaching, everybody else has had to adjust their time schedules. How does that affect you? And I so I added 15 more minutes on the end of mine, Jaime. So you can do that when you're the one setting the schedule. Amen. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'll do my best to stay with what God's given me. If you'll allow me just a few minutes this morning, I'll preach what God has put on my heart, and I believe that it will hopefully help you to grow. Again, this morning uh, we are featuring our children's ministry, but I believe we are featuring ministries all together. Every one of us can be a part of what God has called us to do and what God has placed in us to do. We are called to reach the lost, and reach the lost is the task of not only the church, but it's the task that each one of us needs to do. We need to know that that's our commission and not just the church's great commission. Amen? He gave that to his individuals and his group of disciples, but yes, he said that is the church's position. But it's also given to individuals that it's our task to reach the lost. Because there's a world that's dying, going to hell. And Satan is trying to present every kind of fear factor that he can to drive the church into panic and fear. The world is in a, in a constant state. I mean, uh, uh, literally this week I have had three phone calls of people asking me because they, they, they were coughing and they were not feeling good that they had the coronavirus. I, I, the first thing I said is, have you been overseas? No. Have you met anybody that's been overseas? No. Have you been around anything that might be from overseas? No. I said, so put the enemy out, rebuke it, and say, I rebuke this fear in the name of Jesus Christ, and I take authority over it. Amen? The Bible says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And the enemy's using corona viruses to, to destroy it. Now, I told some of the ladies today that I, I'm not fearful of anything with the coronavirus because I don't drink corona. Amen. So I'm faithful to that. I know God is going to take care of me. So, Amen. Amen. Now, now stay with me just a few minutes. Uh, we're going to get into our message this morning in Acts the ninth chapter. If you have your Bibles, we'll go here. Acts the ninth chapter. And the Bible says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone round him from heaven. And then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard to get, kick against the goads. And he goes on and he says in verse 6, and this is last week's message, I know, but I'm reading it so you can bring you up to where we are today. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. This morning, I'm going to pick up from there. I'm going to begin to preach about Saul's next step, which I believe is your next step. And I believe that God has called us to make next steps. I don't care how long you've been serving God or what all that you have done or your history of where you have accomplished. Those things are great to have. They're great to read about where you came from and remember what God has brought you through. But it didn't stop. You've got to continue to take steps to go forward in your progress with God. Because if you're not growing, you are dying. And to grow means that we put our progression forward. You know who the best evaluator of whether you are growing in your faith or not is? You. If 
Anyway, it's awful quiet in here this morning. Amen. Must be the lateness of the hour. Anyways, so this morning we see, and, and go ahead and pull that next slide up, if you will, Tyler. And we're going to, I want to show you this one. It says, I am a Christian under construction. God's not done with me yet. Would you just turn to somebody and say, I'm glad God's not done with me yet. Because if he was, we'd be going on. If God was done with you, we'd be heading up. So God's got a purpose for you. God's got a reason for you. God's got something for you to do. And if you realize that fact, then you've got to open yourself up and say, God, what do you want me to do? Paul said it best when he said, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. And the greatest thing that we can have is our accomplishment, accomplishment to walk on streets of gold. But until that time, I must preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified to everyone that I meet. We are Christians under construction, moving forward with what God has called us to be. And Paul realized the fact that immediately on his conversion, he became a Christian that was under construction. He had a long t time to change. He had some things that he had to do differently. And Paul was in the process of changing and I want you to take just a few minutes this morning with me and realize the changes that we need to make as we grow and go forward. Let's look at Acts, the ninth chapter, starting in verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. And so when he had received food, he was strengthened, and then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Verse 21, And then all those who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confound the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, providing that this Jesus is the Christ. And he was proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And as we look at this portion of Scripture, and as we look at this, the progression that God brings to us, the progression that God has for us. You see, if your excuse is the reason that I don't feel like I can do anything is because I don't know enough, shame on you. Now here's Paul. And here's what Paul's transition looked like. He was transformed. And I wanted to bring this up. I saw this on, online. And, and this next slide, I, uh, this next picture I want you to look at. Laura, I hope that you can translate this. And I don't know if you can see it from back there. But it says, your calling is not meant to fit who you are today, but who God created you to become. That is such, man, if I could get this in your spirit. To realize that God has a plan and a purpose for you. And that what you are about to become is worthy of God's work in you. He has skilled you and blessed you and has a purpose for you. He has things in you that he wants to use. And when I saw this, I said, I got to show this to people. I got to realize that this is something that God has. You see, you are called. And God has a purpose. And God has a plan for you. And from your birth, he had a plan for you. You see, God knew and had a plan for Saul, even though Saul had a different agenda. And we talked about it last week, how Saul's agenda was that he was going to go around and run havoc in the church. But God had a different plan. And your plan may be that you're going to be successful and rich and wealthy and all the things that we have. But maybe God has a plan for you that you don't necessarily see yet. Maybe it's to be a missionary. Mm. Maybe it's to be a preacher of the gospel. Maybe it's to teach. Maybe it's to be a, a successful man of God. To, to, to be able to honor your family. To lead and guide them in the direction that God has for you. Maybe you're going to be a talented musician or a singer. Look at that person sitting beside you and say, I heard you singing. Keep praying. Maybe you, you're not there yet, and you're, you're not there where, where you want to be, but God has a purpose and a plan for you. And if God called you to it, He will equip you to do what He has called you to do. You are on the process of becoming something that God wants to do, and Saul was there. 
Saul, the first thing that Saul did was he received his sight. The Bible tells us earlier in this text that I read that when Saul was on the ground, he was blinded and he had something like scales that were on his eyes, the Bible says. And, and, and as Ananias prayed for them, the scales fell off his eyes. But the very idea was that he was blind, but now he can see. And the idea of that is so powerful to us that we need to understand that you were once blind, but now you see. Do you know that you can be blinded by religion? Paul was, Saul was. He was blinded by doing his task of religion, and he was blinded that he never saw and really saw the purpose of why Christ was. He never saw the idea of the, the worthiness. He'd been taught in the Word. He knew the Word. He knew everything about the Word, but he did not see where he was or who God was. Some of us can go to church time after time, Sunday after Sunday, be raised in it, but we never really see. We're blind. We may be open and our eyes may be open physically, but spiritually we're blind. We're going through life, running it at our own advantage, at our own pace, in our own way. The Bible tells us about a story, and if you will, and in John the ninth chapter tells of a man who came to Jesus who was physically blind from his birth, but he was also spiritually blind, and later he receives both when he encountered Christ. I want you to look at this in a little closer passage, so I, I broke the scriptures down. If you will, go ahead and pull this next one up. When this man received his sight, now when Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that he, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So the nature of this was, is God was using this man and where he was and his blindness so that he could use him for his glory and his divine purpose. God has a purpose in everything. Some of us may be where we, not particularly where we want to be or where we are, but God has a purpose for everything in our lives. God uses them so we can reach to the lost. God uses our circumstances. Believe it or not, God uses your difficulties so you can be a witness to those who are struggling at the same thing you went through. Mm hmm. He does. He does. Garrett, you want to stand up for a minute? I won't have you walk with me, but I want you to stand up with me. Come on, Bob. This is my buddy. He has one of the greatest walking testimonies of what God did for him. Let me tell you this. Satan wanted to take him, and God had a purpose and a plan for him. And I still believe that his plan and his purpose is still yet to come. I can tell you this. That it didn't happen overnight, but it happened. Satan tried to steal him. Tried to convince him that he didn't need God. Walked him down a path of rebellion to God, but God put his hand in his life and transformed him. And he was transformed. You see, he was, he was raised in the church, but he was spiritually blind. Yeah. Amen? And God used him to open the eyes. And now, the thing that I told Garrett is the reason that I believe, one of the strongest reasons, not only is because, you know, God, God had a reason to save him, but I also believe that God had a reason for him to stand up and today share a message to some of us who are spiritually blind, that are going through motions, that God's saying, it's time you better wake up and see. Amen? Amen. It'll never happen to me. You didn't think it would ever happen to you, did you? You was a big shot. You still are kind of big, but you're not as big a shot as you were. Thank you, Garrett. You just sit down, buddy. But I can tell you this, that as God uses us, God uses this, and I, I share this with Garrett. I, I, I know that Garrett wants to be healed. And I, I, one day, we'll run on streets of gold together. I can tell you that. He, he's got long legs, and he might beat me, but I can tell you these little ones will go fast when they need to. But I can tell you the purpose and the plan that God has. If he can speak a message, if you, just, if you just see, I got a picture of Garrett that his mom put up when he was a swimmer and how big he was. Six foot what, two? Is he Bonnie? Six foot two? 
Six foot two, muscle bound. Six foot three. Don't cheat him an inch now. Come on. I brag on being five, six and a half, and I hold on to that half forever. But as I look at that, I see that God had a purpose. And Satan did everything he could to lure him away from the purpose that God had. Do you know that God is working for you, for his purpose? But Satan is doing everything he can to lure you from that purpose. And if, if you're not careful, you begin to think it's you. And, and I believe that Saul, in his, in his blindness of being spiritually blind, was the fact that Saul saw something that he thought he wanted, saw something. This man was blind from his birth, never seeing anything. When I was a kid, we did this thing, and we were in church, and my Sunday school teacher said, okay, I want everybody to realize what this man here in John the ninth chapter went through. So I want you to all close your eyes so you can't see anything. Well, if you've told a bunch of eight-year-olds to close their eyes, they squint. And I, and I could see a little bit, and I could go through, and I, and I said, ah, it's not that bad. Then she said, well, I can see that this isn't going the way I want to. So she took the, the pillowcases and she tied them around our heads so we couldn't see anything. And she said, now I want you to go downstairs and get something out of the refrigerator. And you should have seen us holding on to the wall, moving along the wall, holding on to each other, scared to death. Let me tell you this. We don't realize what it is to be physically blind, but some of us don't even realize that we are spiritually blind and can't see. Because we're doing the routine and we think we're doing okay, but we're spiritually blind because we've allowed our religion or our righteousness to be something that we brag upon, and God says, you need to know me. Go ahead and pull the next verse up. In John, the, sixth, the ninth chapter, verse 6, and it says, And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay and, and with saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Shalom, which is uh, translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now the first thing that I want you to know is the miracle that he received was the fact that he, could, he was blind but he sees. The fact is, is that he did this. And, and one of the things that I tell people is, is that if, you're, if your doctor prescribes medicine to you, you know Jesus didn't have to spit in the mud to heal him, but he chose to use the mud and spit to do that. God doesn't have to use anything else to heal you with he can just say, and be, be made whole, and you be made whole. But if, if, he, if he chooses to use a prescription, there's nothing wrong with that. It's not a lack of faith to take it. It's the ability of God to heal. Sometimes we have to take it because we have brutalized our body by neglect. Is it okay if I say this? Love me anyways. But we eat the wrong things. We do the wrong things. We don't do the right things. And then we go to the doctor and he says, you got high blood pressure. you got to be on this medicine the rest of your life. It may destroy your kidney. It may destroy your liver. But you got to be on it. Oh, aren't you glad? But I realize this. There's no weakness of my faith in taking what I have to take. But it's, and it's not a lot. If, if Jesus sped in the mud and applied, somebody said, well, it was maybe magic mud. I don't know. I'm not saying it's magic mud. I'm not saying it was holy spit, that's for sure. One time I was teaching a bunch of kids, and when I said it was holy spit, and it came out of my mouth and landed on the person right there in front of me. And they said, I don't think yours is holy. Yours is just nasty. But, but when Jesus applied the mud to the man's eyes, and he prayed for him, and when he laid the, the mud upon his eyes, uh, the man went and washed because he was told to do it. And when he washed, he was made whole, and he was healed. Blindness faded. When you do what God tells you to do, your spiritual blindness will fall away. Your eyes will be open to the reality of how far you really are from what God wants you to be and what God wants of you. And sometimes we would rather go through the world spiritually blind because we don't want to change and we don't want to grow. We don't want to do anything that's uncomfortable to us. 
And so we'd rather wander spiritually blind than do what Jesus had said. Go ahead and pull the next one up. And so when it when they again called the man, and after this the Pharisees, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead, I know. For those of you who know the story, you can read through it in the ninth chapter there. But the Pharisees and everybody and all those that were around him tried to question the man and tried to say, this man is not of God. They accused Jesus of being a sinner. But one of my favorite passages of Scripture uh, is found in this ninth chapter, verse 24, and it says, and they again called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. And he's talking about Jesus. And he answered and said, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. He was admitting to himself and at this point, he was admitting, I am spiritually blind. That's exactly what he says in that sentence right there. Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I can see. Though I was, I can now see. One of the greatest things that we can say is that I was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I can see. That amazing grace, that amazing work of God where he says that the very passage of that, that song says that he was blind but now he sees. This takes this text and brings it to a new level. You see, to this morning you may be sitting here today and you may be spiritually blind. You may be going through the motions and you may be going through the circumstances trying to fool everybody around you. But God knows whether you're wandering around spiritually blind because you haven't found your purpose. You haven't found your place. You haven't found what God wants you to do. You've ignored all the calls. You've ignored all the opportunities opportunities I know I was there I was about 19 or 20 years old and I can remember when God turned my life around and said it's time for you to do what I want you to do I said God there ain't no way I don't want to be up front I have dyslexia I don't, I'm embarrassed to read in front of people I, I, I don't I, that, that's not who I am God see I tried to convince God Moses tried to do the same thing it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's part of our human nature is just to say, well, I can't do that. Come on. How many of you have ever said in yourself to God, I can't do it? Come on. I can't do it because... Now, now listen, I remember one time when we were at Pace and Skylar, your parents might... I don't think they were there at the church yet, but I remember when, when I was there... And, I had neglected my opportunity to learn the piano. My parents tried to teach me, but I wouldn't, wouldn't learn. And we finally got a piano at the church, but we had no piano player. We got a church, the piano there, and, and I sat down at the piano. And Sister Lou, I sat down, and I said, God, I've seen and heard you do miracles where you just anoint people's fingers where they can play the piano. And they, they sit down there, and they play, and they go at it. And I know, God, you can do that for me. So I... After I prayed that prayer, James, I put my hands on the keys and I started to make, just move across it and push those keys down. And it was the worst noise I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> it was awful. It was terrible. And I kept trying. I said, God, let my right hand, my left hand work together so we can figure this thing out. We need a musician. And God said, you blew your chance, son. God sent somebody to play the piano. That next Sunday, God just wanted me to know, could have, but you didn't. You could have, but you didn't. I go on and I, I, I see this section of Scripture and I begin to realize the fact that when we were, we were blinded by this nature, this man who was blind from his birth realized who Christ was and came out of the very nature of this. In verse 35 through 38 of that same text in the ninth chapter, Jesus heard this man and cast, had cast him out. And when they threw, the, the Pharisees got mad because he had bragged on Jesus and who he was and said, I don't know who he is. Jesus found him after they had thrown him out of the temple. And when, they had found, when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? And here's what he says. He says, he answered and said, who is he, Lord, that, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he 
who is talking to you. Then he answered and said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. What a powerful transition that happened in this man's life. Because he was physically blind and he could see. And that, that, that passage of scripture that's right there that says, You have both seen him and it is he who is talking to you. Wow. Let me tell you what it is. Sometimes that that still small voice, that tugging when you do something, you know you're not supposed to. Ooh, I feel God in this place speaking to somebody. You know you're not supposed to do it, but you do it anyways. That tugging that says you shouldn't do that. Better not do that. But you say, ah, I can. You know what I I said, God, if it's not from you, uh, then strike me dead. But if it is, if if you don't want me to do this, then God just just strike me dead, or keep me from doing it. You know what God said? I want you to choose not to do it. Come on. And I had to make a choice, and, and you have to make a choice. And the Bible tells us that. He, he said, you, you, you didn't see me, but you knew me. Uh, you didn't know me. Now you know me, and you see me. And the man believed, and he worshipped him. The, the most powerful thing that we can relate to this is that this man was blind, but now he sees. Saul was blind, but now he sees. Saul was, uh, the, the very change that transitioned in his life was the blindness that if, if he would have been able to see, he would never have humbled his life to Christ. He would have got back on his donkey and went ahead with his details, but God had to stop him. When God transferred the very works of this man's life, he changed his life forever. Both spiritually and physically, he would never be the same. Because not only could he physically see, but spiritually he knew Jesus Christ. The second thing that we realize is, is that he was strengthened with his disciples. Here's the part that I want the church to realize. Is that we must realize that we need each other. Amen? Our church should be disciples helping disciples. Go ahead and pull that next one up. And so when they had heard and received food, he was, he was strengthened. And then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Go ahead and pull that next one up. Our purpose as a church should be disciples making disciples. One of the visions of, of my church and, and my, uh, my role as a pastor here is that we are not just going through the motions to get people saved, but we are making disciples. Our goal should be disciples so that we can make disciples. Amen? And when we come to that place, we will be reproducing what God has called us to be. Go ahead and pull that next one up. We should be working on developing, not on sitting on seats dissolving. That's quotable. Somebody put that out on there. So, what do you call that? The, anyways, never mind. Tweet it or twerp it or whatever you do. 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 2, and it says, And the things you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Our goal is to rise up so that we can instruct others. And there's always someone who needs a mentor or needs someone to instruct them and guide them. When we come alongside someone, it's not confrontational, it's developmental. Amen? We encourage them because somebody took the time to encourage us. And when we develop someone, it is rewarding and it is also sustaining. Paul had the disciples gathered around him. I love it this morning when we, we gather in the office and we pray in the power of God. And, and, and one of the things that I love is because we have fellowship with brothers in Christ. Amen? I love our men's group. By the way, we have breakfast at 8.30 next Saturday. Don't miss it. Come on. You knew I'd get that plug in there somewhere. We could, but but here, here's what we, because the, the, the nature of our, our text for our men's group is iron sharpens iron. You know what it is? Is if you're there and I'm there and we never clang together, we'll never be sharp. That's why we have a bunch of dull people in the church. 
bad joke, but I tell you what, that is spiritually true. Because we distance ourselves and we never sharpen each other. But we must be willing to clang together so we can sharpen each other for the purpose of God. You need me and I need you whether you like it or not. There are some people that just don't like it. Go ahead, pull that next one up. Our message to the world is simple. Preach Christ, who He is, and what He has done for you. Saul's next step was very powerful for Saul. He had to come to the place of realizing that he had to be the one to take the message. He preached about who Christ was. It was simple. It was the fact that he had to take this simple message of Jesus Christ and tell the world who He was. You don't have to know how to quote every scripture in the Bible. You just have to know who he is and live it before them. I I figured this out. Why more people don't personal evangelize today is because we're afraid of people knowing that we are believers. Come on. Why don't we tell our friends at school, Jesus Christ saved me. Come on, why, we, why don't we tell our family? You know what? I, I remember every summer when I was going through the teen, teen years and we were raised in the church, some of you that were there too, and I would go to youth camp and I would get saved every year. I would be baptized. I was baptized so many summers that I got wrinkles from just going to camp. And they would, they would baptize me. I'd come back home. And the first thing I would do is I would say, I'm going to go back to my friends and James, I'm going to win the entire community. I'm going to win all my friends to Jesus Christ. First thing they would do, we'd have a back to school party. And I'd show up and I'd say, I'm going to win them all. By that time, you know what happens after you stay out of the water for a while? Your wrinkles go away. I forgot what had happened to me. That God had saved me and forgave me. And instead of being different than my friends, I wanted to fit in. So I did what they did and I followed along with what they had, were doing. And the next thing you know, I was right back where I'd been delivered from. Mm -hmm. God called me out from that. And God changed me. And it wasn't until I realized that I couldn't go back, that I had to be changed, that I had to go forward. That's when I began to realize that God didn't call me to fit in. God called me to, to stand away from it, to be separate from it, and to be different so that people can look at me and say, there's something different about it. The Bible even calls you this. Now, I want you to look at that person sitting beside you Look him right in the eyes. Just look him right in the eye. The Bible says you're to be a peculiar person. Peculiar. That doesn't mean odd, Chuck. Not to say that you're odd, Chuck, but it means you you be, be peculiar. You're different than the ordinary. Do they say that when you walk through the halls at your school or at work? Do they say... There's something different about you. What's different about you? You don't act like the rest of us. You don't do like the rest of us. I actually saw you pray over your food. Well, there are some cafeterias I've eaten in that I would pray anyways. But here's the thing. One of the best ways to preach the gospel is not quote the Bible, but live the Bible before them. Live the transformation of Jesus Christ in your life. You want, to, you want to see something different when your family, when somebody close to you has known you. Manny, I remember when your dad and your mom, when they first told me about it, I think they were as shocked about his change as anybody. Well, the, other than Laura maybe, but uh, when, the, when change happens like that, it just, it's shocking. And, and we don't, I'm not necessarily talking about the outward, out, outward sign of what we change, but it's the difference in the heart. I remember when Laura was telling me, I said, what was the most difference in Manny? Because if you saw him, man, he would scare you to death. He, had, he rode a big old chopper with a long fork on it, had wild hair and a big old beard. He was the guy that you walked on the other side of the street from. You know, you'd see him coming and you'd say, oh, I'm going over here. And then I said, Laura, what was the biggest change? And I was thinking she would say, he doesn't drink anymore. He doesn't cuss anymore. You know what she said? He treats me better. 
He treats me better. You want, you want, you want to have a, a 101 marriage counseling session? I can tell you right now. I can tell you how to develop every relationship. Put God in the center of it, and it's going to get better. Amen? I, I'm meddling, and I'll go on. Stay with me for just a few more minutes. I'm almost done. Dave, if you'll get ready. Go ahead. Romans 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Go ahead and pull the next one up. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, the, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Transformation happens when we begin to believe Transformation happens when we realize it is the cross that brought the change. When, when Saul realized that it was this Jesus who he was persecuting became the reason of his salvation. It changed his life. It changed his message. It changed his purpose. His next step was to serve God the way that God had designed him to be. And even those around him were talking about the transformation. Go ahead and pull that next one up. The transformation that happened in Saul was one that they noticed. He showed the power of change. Then all who heard were amazed and said, it is, not, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, provide, proving that this is Jesus the Christ. He simply showed the change. The change that took place. Do people see enough of Christ in you to realize there's something different about you? Or are you just trying to fit in? 